All right, I've been working on the 5.0 Ranger a little bit this weekend. Had a couple little maintenance projects. Basically doing the same thing over again a couple times. First thing I had to do was over on the passenger side. Uh, if you've seen my earlier videos, you know that I replaced the... Um, I actually replaced the exhaust manifolds on both sides with new gaskets, etc. And over on this side, I had a leak develop over the winter. So I went ahead and got some, the Percy's, the uh, oval port gaskets work pretty good. And I went ahead and replaced them again and uh, made sure everything was sealed up good. So got that out of the way. Hopefully I won't have an exhaust tick now. And then uh, it's getting hot. And I realized that my AC was not working, the one I just installed last year. And what I thought was the reason was because, I'll try to show you here. This is the AC condenser. It mounts to the front of the radiator. And it goes up the front here. Well... Before I started working on this, I had an issue, as you can see, this is a cross support here that goes across the front. That's supposed to go all the way across the front. Well, it's rusted pretty bad under here, and uh, it had some of the rust, the jagged edges on the rust had like collapsed into the AC condenser. So I live in a pretty rural area with real bumpy roads, and basically rubbed a little hole in one of the tubes on the condenser and it caused a little freon leak which I tried to fix it the cheap way and use a stop leak that I've had luck with in the past which should have worked and I think it did work even though I thought it didn't so what I discovered I bought a new condenser and took the radiator out and installed a brand new condenser, etc. etc. And for those of you who are wondering, the radiator is a just from a 95 Ranger, it's the four liter two core radiator. So if you're going to put a five liter in your older Ranger like this, this radiator will work as long as you have the two core, it's the double thickness core radiator. They sell a cheaper one that's only half the thickness. I guarantee you'll overheat with that though. So if you get the two inch thick double core aluminum factory radiator, it will work. And as I explained in my other videos, the condenser for the AC is from a 97 Explorer. And the reason that is, is so the lines will match up. Down in here, move the hose out of the way, you have where it connects into this side and this tube this hose here is also from a 97 Explorer. It runs down, connects to the bottom of the evaporator where it runs in. And then you have the receiver dryer, and which is for a Explorer also. A Ranger, it doesn't actually matter. They're the same thing. And this line here is from an Explorer. runs across the front of the engine, over the compressor, etc. Um, where the AC line comes out over here, same thing, it connects there, runs to this pipe here, and then to the back of the compressor. But anyway, back to what I was saying. I also discovered, after I put the new condenser in, that I was still, I wasn't holding manifold vacuum on my AC gauges. What you have to do is use a vacuum pump, and I've got one from Harbor Freight. Draw it down, and I let it run for a good, I don't know, probably an hour. And you want it to hold at negative 30 inches of vacuum, and it wasn't holding. So I had a leak somewhere else in the system. And where I discovered it was actually at was where this sensor over here screws on. It had developed a leak in here, and I could see... Uh, like some crust in here from where uh, oil and freon had been escaping. So once I put a new O-ring on and sealed that up, the leak went away. 
so this has been since yesterday afternoon still at negative 30 this is where I left it so I'm pretty confident that there's no more leaks in the system and we're ready to charge it up uh, I just put coolant in the Ranger just refilled it with new coolant so I'm going to start it up and charge the AC system real quick um, again if you are adding AC to your Ranger uh, you'll have to know how much Freon to put it in, how much oil. Um, you can look up these charts. I pretty much went with what it recommended for a 97 Explorer. The only uh, consideration would be, because if you think about it, under the hood, a Ranger and an Explorer are identical. The only difference would be if the Explorer you were, were taking into account had rear air, so you'd want one that did not have rear if you're looking at your measurements. In this case, it calls for about 22 ounces of R134A. And it's like 9 ounces of oil, maybe. can't remember. The oil's already in the system. I just got to recharge it with the uh, Freon. Uh, the stock 95 Ranger on here says 1 pound, 1 pound 9 ounces. Which is actually more like... 24 25 ounces uh, so there is a difference I have found though that uh, the last setup I had it ran ideally with about um, about 24 ounces of Freon so that's two whole cans I believe they're 12 ounce cans so ideally just two of these cans should be pretty good and the way to know that is by looking at your gauges. I'm not going to give you the full AC tutorial here, but it's based off of the ambient temperature and your low side and your high side pressure. Um, you know, there's plenty of tutorials on YouTube you can look at to see exactly how to know when you're good. But I just know that about 24 ounces and my setup here is running nice and cold and everything's working as it should. So at any rate, um, although this wasn't meant to be a really tutorial, more of an update video, I, I will just mention again that um, if you are retrofitting the AC into your 5 liter conversion and you have a similar setup to mine, a couple things to note. This sensor here is from the Ranger and this is the factory location for the Ranger for this high, this limit switch. So that actually just threaded right on to the Explorer setup here, the evaporator dryer. However, the sensor over here was not on the Ranger. So when I pulled this, uh, this line from the junkyard, luckily it still had the, the um, limit switch and the wiring. Um, let me take that back. There is another switch on the Ranger, but in my case, it wasn't here. And it wasn't wired into the correct spot. So I basically just took, I had the pigtail, I extended the wiring, it runs around and connects into the harness down under here. There was actually, uh, where the Explorer and the Ranger harness come together, um, there's like, you know, a certain number of wires coming in on the Ranger harness, and there's only a few wires coming out on the Explorer harness, that's how you know you're in the right spot. You use a wiring diagram, I was able to find the two wires that weren't being used. I just tapped into those and then ran them over to the limit switch. So everything works exactly as it should. You know, I didn't have to modify anything inside or any of the controls, any of that. It just, it works, everything works. So also, I just completed adding a new fan controller. Um, I've ha I had really bad luck with um, some of the aftermarket, you know, like the $30 Amazon price range fan controllers. I had one that was adjustable. It had a little probe that went into the radiator. Just that lasted, that lasted, you know, not even six months. Almost left me stranded. In another video, I show how to make a, uh, a jumper harness to wire the fan directly to the battery in an emergency. I did use that to get home. It worked perfectly. So I decided to make my own, um, without getting into it in too much detail, 
if, if you really want to know how to do this, I can send you a little rough schematic of the, the wiring, but I've got mine set up. It uses two relays and I got three fused um, harnesses here. And how it works is uh, I have this temperature sensor that I plumbed into the heater hose right where it comes out of the intake manifold and goes into the heater core. And the reason you use this is it's, it's, it's essentially the same thing as plugging it into the intake because this is the hot line right where it comes out of the intake manifold. I had to do this because obviously there's not another spot to plumb into on the intake manifold. Uh, the, the fact the three, two spots are filled up with the, the gauge sender for the dash and the one that can sends the ECT sensor for the computer. So I plug this little switch and what this switch does is it, it uh, basically causes a connection between ground um, and how to, I did that is I had to solder on a connection to here since this isn't in the intake manifold it's not grounded just by screwing it into the heater hose and then I grounded it to the firewall and then the top so basically at 200 degrees I tested it, it is like right at 199 this completes the circuit it sends a ground signal through this line runs over and it grounds one of my relays to turn the fan system on um, one of the relays is just a control to change a ground to a positive. Like I said, if you want more information about that, I can I can send you something. But long story short, when you turn the key forward, you've energized the, the system, but the fan does not come on until it reaches 200 degrees. It'll shut off at 1 in 185 degrees. Also, I tapped into the purple wire that comes out of this switch here, and what this is, this has got a plus 12 volt signal anytime your switch is in the max AC, AC, or the defrost position. Anytime basically it's calling for the compressor to run, that switch is energized. That I also fed over to my relays here, and you need to diode protect that line. That way you don't have any current backfeeding into the AC system. You don't obviously want. Uh, you know, your fan running anytime the uh, fan circuit just kicks on and the AC's off, or you, you don't want your compressor trying to kick on. Um, so that's diode protected and fused, and that runs over, and that can will manually override my temperature control, and will kick the fans on as soon as you put the AC on or the defroster on. Basically, anytime the compressor's running to protect the uh, condenser, it will manually override and start the fan. So everything works on it. Uh, I've tested it out. As soon as it hits like 199 degrees, the fans kick on, which is lower than the factory temperature, which is a good thing. Um, and then, uh, honestly, the fans usually won't turn back off once they hit it because the th factory thermostat's 190 degrees, so you're never really going to get down to 185. If I could, you know, have the switch be anything I wanted, it would have been a 200 slash 190 temperature differential. But... They don't make that that I could find. So this is an Amazon part. Mixed reviews. I got a good one, apparently, because it, it kicks right off at 185 and kicks on at like 199 right at 200, just like it's supposed to. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and fire it up and get this coolant circulating. Check for leaks. Good thing is, is no exhaust leak. All right, well, hopefully this video helps some of you out who might be considering this project or in the middle of one of these projects. If you have any questions, leave me a comment below. I'll try to get back to you. Thanks.